Well, hello, Leadership Network and uh, other pastors that are listening in when in this Conference of the Nines. My name is J.D. Greer, and I am the lead pastor here at the Summit Church in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Our church uh, is nestled right here amongst um, well over 100,000 college students. In fact, Forbes magazine has ranked this the number one educational hub in America for many years in a row. So we have a pretty wide open uh, mission field when it comes to college students. Uh, it makes for a pretty interesting um, challenge to church unity when you have UNC and Duke students and NC State students all in the same place. But uh, it means we have a lot of potential missionaries. We feel like our goal is to raise up uh, students who don't know God at all to sending them out as church planters. Uh, we feel like the mission that God has given us is to plant a thousand churches in the next 40 years. And uh, it means we got a lot of work to do. Uh, but the fact that we have a lot of college students means that we have a lot of potential church planners. In fact, we tell them that unless they've heard from God otherwise, they need to plan on spending uh, two years after they graduate uh, overseas somewhere in one of our, our church plants or in one of our church plants here in the United States. Uh, we call that the, the Mormonization of our, of our church. Um, I want to uh, talk to you uh, in the, the seven minutes and 46 seconds that I have remaining. Um, about something very, um, very central to um, the ministry as I've begun to understand it. Uh, and that is I want to make a case to you about what the center of all of our ministries um, as churches ought to be. Um, I know that churches have a lot of different things. Sometimes they like to emphasize things they build their church around. Some churches are really into uh, racial reconciliation. Some are really into... Um, social justice and serving the needs of the poor. Some are into um, relevant family ministry. Some are into discipleship. But I want to make a case to you that the center of our ministries has to be, as Jesus, um, I believe, instructed, has to be the proclamation of the gospel. Um, in Acts chapter 1, the disciples had a pretty interesting discussion with Jesus. Uh, they come together with him on the mountain, and right before he leaves them, um, they ask him a question. They say, Lord, at this time, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, they had some, some theological questions, or I believe the term is eschatology. Um, Jesus didn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't answer them really as they wanted. He didn't you know, say, well, you know, hang on, my servant Tim will, hey, we'll, we'll write some books and clear all these eschatology questions up. Uh, no, he, he said, you were to go and you are to be my, my witnesses. Um, it, what is interesting to me is that at that point, Jesus did not look at the disciples and say, um, guys, am I supposed to restore the kingdom? Building the kingdom is your job. Uh, no, he said, He said, really, your primary task is to be a witness to me, uh, preachers of the gospel. You see, the gospel is primarily an announcement um, about what Jesus has done. As we know, the word gospel was not an exclusively religious word. In fact, its origins were in, um, in, in Greek wartime uh, whenever a general would win a battle. He would often send news of that victory uh, by means of a gospel carrier, an evangelist, who would go to the cities that he had protected or that he had liberated. And he would say that the gospel carrier would say, I bring you the gospel, the good news of General so-and-so. Uh, the general has won the battle. You are no longer slaves. You no longer need to live in fear. You are, are free men. Well, in the same way, Jesus' apostles and we were sent out with an announcement about what he had done. Um, the gospel, uh, the, the Greek uh, gospel carriers were not giving an invitation to the people to come and join the battle, but declaring to them that the, that the battle had already been won. In the same way, we, as we go out, um, our, our, our message is not primarily even for people to come and join um, the battle, but it is primarily to announce to them what Christ has done on their behalf. What I mean by all this is that we can never confuse the effects of the gospel, which is radical missional living, with the message of the gospel itself. Um, serving the poor, racial reconciliation, um, growing in our knowledge um, of, of doctrine and theology, um, you, you know, discipleship living, the, the radical generosity, those are the effects of the gospel, but they, those things are not the gospel itself. I mean, Galatians 3 is clear that racial reconciliation is the effect of understanding the gospel. Radical generosity to the poor is the effect of understanding the gospel. The reason I say all this is because any time we preach a gospel that is more about what we are to go and do for God 
rather than about what God has done on our behalf, we have preached a false gospel. The gospel is the good news about what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf when he died in our place, substituted for us as sinners, and won our victory. And we are to spend our lives responding to that. That's why I think Paul would have made statements like he did in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, that he determined to know nothing among anybody except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In everything that Paul taught, you see that whether he was talking about how to be a good husband in Ephesians 5, whether he was talking about racial reconciliation in Galatians 3, whether he was talking about um, how to live the Christian life in Romans 12, he ties all of it to understanding what Christ has done for us. And he says, in light of of what God has done for you in light of the fact that Jesus Christ who is rich for our sake became poor then we ought to be generous and this is how we ought to respond so again we can never confuse the effects of the gospel with the actual message of the gospel itself now that said in uh, see how long I have left uh, in the book of Acts uh, what you see is that anytime the gospel is preached there are also signs that were given of the gospel a sign was um, a physical demonstration, a tangible demonstration of what the message of the gospel, um, what the message of the gospel was. Uh, for example, when Jesus did signs, he not only did he preach the gospel of peace and sight, he also opened blind eyes. Now, Jesus' signs pointed back to the message. They were temporary signs. You know, every blind eye that Jesus ever healed went blind again one day. Right, because everybody that he healed their blindness, they died. In the same way, um, the signs that we do in our community, they're in many ways temporary signs. Uh, the ghettos we rebuild will be ghettos again one day because we can't build the kingdom. Uh, we can give witness to the kingdom. We can give a sign of the kingdom. Uh, we are to, and the way I've heard it once said, is we are to sketch out in pencil what one day Jesus will paint uh, with ink. Uh, but when we preach the gospel, we do these signs, not as ends in themselves, but as signifiers of, of the message. Uh, our church really came to understand this when we were, um, I was teaching through the book of Acts, and I came to Acts 8 where it talked about Philip going into Samaria, and as a result of the works that he did and the message he preached, Acts 8, 7 says there was much joy in the city. I, I asked our congregation, is there much joy in the city as a result of our being here? And I felt like the answer was no. Acts 9 says that Tabitha, um, a disciple named Tabitha, whose other name was Dorcas, and she probably should have stuck with Tabitha, by the way. Uh, but it says that when she died, the community gathered at her bedside and wept because of the good works that, that she had done for them. And I asked our church, I said, if the Summit Church died, uh, would anybody in our city weep? And we felt like the answer was, was no. And we repented as a church and said, we no longer want to just just preach here. In addition to preaching, like the apostles, like Jesus, we want to give signs of this message. And so we approached many of the public schools and said, we're not trying to come in and pass out tracks or do choir specials or, um, or, or anything like that. We just want to come in and serve you. And um, we picked out the, the worst ranked school in all of Durham County and said, can we just serve uh, you and we um, painted their facilities. We renovated. We we built a lot. We came in and helped tutor their their kids, and we prayed over their end of year test. In the four years that we served them, they went from being the worst ranked um, school in Durham County to being um, the one that had the highest end of the year exams passed. And that public school principal in the school newspaper said, "We give want to give credit where credit's due, and that is to the glory of God that was expressed to us through the Summit Church. Um, there was joy in the city." So I say all this to say I, I would encourage us after the pattern of Acts that the gospel be central in our message, that in all the ministry we do, in all the feeding of the poor, we not lose sight of the fact that the gospel is an announcement, is an announcement about what Jesus did. The gospel is, an, is, is not primarily about something we are to do for God, but, but an, an announcement about what he has done for us. And that we, whenever we preach the gospel, signify that by giving radical demonstrations of generosity and love in our community. So that our community would say, man, we may not believe what those people believe, but thank God they're here because they care for our poor. Uh, they love us. Without them, we'd have to raise our taxes. And, uh, and I think therein we would adorn the gospel because, as has been said, I think by Francis Schaeffer, love is the most powerful apologetic for the gospel. Thank you.